Hey guys, Richard Oldner here and welcome to the channel. Please make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell so you get notified when we do all these videos. Where are my big block fans? Today we're going to take a look at a couple of different things. One, valve flow and how to cure. We're also going to look at optimized ignition timing. Then we're going to take a look at a cylinder head upgrade on a big block 468 Chevy. And oh yeah, I'm going to throw in an intake test just because. In this video, we're going to take a look at a number of tests we ran on a 468 big block Chevy. Now, this was a built 468, meaning it had forged internals, it had good cylinder heads, it had a good camshaft, a good intake manifold, carburetor, all of that stuff. So the test was very awesome. First thing we did was run a test on valve springs. Our cylinder heads were originally equipped with valve spring setup for a flat tappet cam, but we were running a hydraulic roller cam with predictable results. Next, we're going to show you what happens when you tune the motor. We started out with low timing, then added more and more timing until the motor stopped making power. That's how we do it on the dyno. Then finally, I'm going to show you what happens when we upgrade the cylinder heads. And this is an interesting comparison. The big iron rec board heads actually flow more than the smaller Airflow Research 265 oval port heads. But guess what? Just because they flowed more doesn't mean they make more power. Let's check it out. When you look at horsepower and torque curves like this, the first thing you should be thinking is, hey, Richard, there's something wrong there. That is not a very good dyno curve. And you'd be absolutely right. What happened here is this is a telltale sign, obviously, that there is a problem with the motor. In this case, it turns out that it's valve springs. And another way to see when this happens is if you run an air hat on and you're measuring the air, the air is not going up. In fact, the air can, the airflow can actually go down, which it never does when everything is right. The airflow continues to increase as you go up in RPM. Even if the power is falling off, the airflow is actually going up. But on something like this, when we see a dramatic drop in power, that's almost always indicative of there being a problem. Maybe a rocker fell off, or in this case, we have valve float. And here's what happened when we cured our valve float. But first, we need to get to our combination. The combination is a 468, which means it is a 60 over big block 454. This particular combination featured forged rods and forged uh and a forged crank from Speed, the guys at Speedmaster. It had an H-beam rod. We also installed a set of probe forged dome pistons, 20cc dome pistons that also had enough valve relief that allowed us to use a, a good sized camshaft in this case. The camshaft we installed in this combination was from Comp Cams. It was an off the shelf extreme energy XR294HR, which featured a 540-560 lift split. You could obviously, this head would certainly take more lift, but this was a good kind of middle of the road performance hydraulic roller cam. It also had a 242-248 degree duration split and 110 degree lobe separation angle. The combination was topped off with a YN Team G single plane rec port intake manifold and a 950 Holly HP carburetor, more than enough carburetion for this power output. The compression on this combination with the small dome piston and 119cc head on the 088 rec port heads was 9.7 to 9.8 to 1, a good, a good street compression with an iron head. We ran this combination with our two and a quarter long tube dyno headers, a Mazir electric water pump, MSD distributor, uh, and a I think that this was a Mylodon oil pan. So run in this configuration, but the cylinder heads were first supplied with a valve spring package that was designed, we think, for a hydraulic or possibly a solid flat tap at cam. Now the springs measured when we took them off, 120 pounds of seat pressure and 345 pounds of open pressure at 600 valve lifts. So they're entirely inadequate for our hydraulic roller application. But you might be thinking, hey, Richard, why would you do that? Why would you run those springs knowing that they're wrong for that application? And the reason that I do that is because we, we tell you, you need enough valve spring with a hydraulic roller cam or a solid roller cam, but it's better to show you actually what happens. And this way I can also show you that if you run a light spring, you might be able to get away with it. If you're shifting at 5,500 or possibly even 58 or 5,900, you might be able to get away with it. It might still work if you get to the point before it just gets uncontrollable and falls off. But here's what happened when we installed a spring upgrade on this combination. And the spring upgrade that we installed increased the, the, both the seat and the open pressure, 145 pounds of seat pressure and 400 pounds of open pressure. So you see a big, a big step up and you can go even more than that on a hydraulic roller and it will still work. But here's what happened when we fixed our valve spring issue. 
you can see now the the curve was just continuing out past 6,000 RPM. We would eventually rev this thing higher than this, but this was actually with very, very soft timing. We were just starting our, our, our load ins and we were just starting our tuning and stuff. And when we found out, obviously, that the valve springs are not adequate, and that way we could do this valve spring upgrade. So what we did then is go from here. We upgraded. This was run with 35 degrees of total timing. The timing was locked on this combination. The distributor's locked. All we had to do is move it to adjust the timing. This was at 35 degrees. Now, this rec port head, this 119cc rec port iron head, wanted more timing this, and it responded to, we eventually put 41 or 42 degrees of timing in this thing. And here's what we eventually got after all of the tuning. This combination produced 541 horsepower, so a much nicer looking curve. Peak torque checked in at 512 foot-pounds of torque. So not bad for a factory rec port headed combination, an iron head, you know, for a 468 with a reasonable cam in it. This thing, you know, made fairly good power. And most importantly, it was now revving out the 6500. We had cured the valve float issue. Uh, although if you look out at 6500, we're falling down a little bit. For a hydraulic roller at 6500, I'd actually like to see a little bit more spring pressure than this. Something in the 150 to 160 pounds of seat pressure and then possibly 420 to 430 or 440 open pressure uh, because th those numbers were coming at 600 valve lift and we weren't quite at 600 valve lift with our 1.7 roller rockers on this comp cam. So I'd like to see a little bit more spring pressure, but this thing worked out fairly well. So now let's see what happened when we upgraded from here. This was an excellent opportunity to demonstrate what happens when we upgrade the valve springs and show you valve float actually in action on the dyno. And it's also a good opportunity to demonstrate what happens and, and why we go about doing timing sweeps to find out what kind of additional power is available through timing. Basically what we do is we add timing until the thing stops making power. We ran the 41 degrees or 42 degrees of timing on 91 pump gas and it worked just fine. We're running the motor a little bit colder than normal. So we don't have to worry about detonation nearly as much as people do on the street. But if you're going to the track and you're gonna cool the motor down before you make your run and try to get maximum power, this is the kind of thing that you would do. But what we did is on this test, we would upgrade the rec port heads with a set of much smaller AFR-265 oval port head. So there's a lot to discuss about this upgrade, but first I'll go ahead and show you this was our rec port head and the final combination, two, or, uh, 541 horsepower, 512 foot-pounds of torque. And here's what happened when we installed the AFR-265 heads, they're 265 oval port heads. We also installed a matching Again, a single plane like the YN that was used on the rec port heads. We, we, we installed a Edelbrock Victor Jr., the 454O, designed for the oval port heads, even though this was a fairly small oval port on the 265. And we used the same 950 carburetor on there. Run with the airflow research heads. The power output jumped to 619 horsepower and 568 foot-pounds of torque. But as you can see, it was basically better just everywhere. So there are a couple things to talk about here. One the chamber size on the AFR head was a little bit smaller. The fact the 088 heads were 119 cc's and the AFR heads were 112. So that raised the compression by six or seven tenths, which if you do the calculation is going to add between 10 and 12 horsepower on a motor with a power output like this, because it's about three to four percent per one full point of compression. So you can do that calculation, but, but 10 or 12 is a reasonable amount. And obviously, we're gaining way more than 10 or 12%. So uh, guys want to point to the compression as the reason that it gains so much power. That's not it. <laughs> it's actually that the airflow head is a lot better than the factory rec port head than the 088 head. And here's an interesting thing. The, the 088, the big rec port head actually flows more than the airflow research head does. The, if you measured it at its peak, the rec port head flows 334 CFM. The airflow research flowed 331 CFM. But here's the interesting thing. So you might be wondering, well, Richard, why, why wouldn't it make more power if it flows more? Well, that flow number came for the rec board head at 700 lift. The peak flow number for the airflow research came at a much more usable, at least for our cam, 600 lift. The other thing is, and this is way more important than any of the peak flow values, because the power output, the potential of the motor is not a function of that peak flow number. 
not nearly as much. We see power production really is based on the average flow through the whole curve. And if you take a look at the airflow research in the really important mid-lift areas, two, three, and 400 lift, the airflow research head outflowed the bigger factory head by as much as 50 CFM through the mid-range. So through the mid-lift numbers. So those are huge amounts, and that's that's area that it's going to be using a lot more as the as the valve travels up and down through this lift range, it's seeing that twice. It's only seeing the peak lift number once. So those are much more important and much more determining of what's going to happen on the power gain. The other thing is, if you take a look at the exhaust flow difference between these two heads, you'll see that the airflow research head flows 280 CFM. The iron head flows 197 CFM. So that's a dramatic difference in exhaust flow. Getting that air in, you'll also have to get it out. So the airflow research head obviously is a much better head. And the, I like the fact that it was a very small 265 head and it works so well in this combination. This was run with a single plane intake, but I think it's important also for guys that might be looking at this to think, okay, well, what, what would it do with a dual plane? And we ran exactly that. For a guy that wants more low speed power and might be willing to trade off a little bit at the top, here's what happened when we ran an RPM air gap. So you can see the green is the single plane and the red is the RPM air gap below 4,700 RPM down in here, down in this area right in here. The air gap was up on the single plane by 525 foot-pounds versus 564. So 40 foot-pounds down low, it was much better. That's kind of where you're going to spend most of your driving. And honestly, the signal to the carburetor and all that stuff is going to be better with the dual plane than it is with a single plane. But there is a trade-off in power. From 4,700 on up, the single plane did better. So it depends on where you want your power. This might be a hood fitment issue, but I wanted to run both of these to give people an idea. On a 454 or a 468, guys might still be considering a single plane or, or, or a dual plane over the single plane. And this is kind of what you would expect. Honestly, with this camshaft, I think the va vast majority of people probably would lean toward the single plane, but dual plane, always a nice option. Let's get to our conclusion. Okay, guys, what do we learn in this little adventure with our 468 cubic inch big block Chevy? Well, a lot of things. First of all, valve springs, very, very important. If you want to rev the motor out to 6,500 RPM or beyond with a hydraulic roller cam, you're definitely going to need enough valve spring. The other interesting thing that I wanted to point out, if you take a look at the power curves, you'll see that even with the lighter valve spring, Everything was under control all the way up almost to 6,000 RPM. So if you had a combination like this where you had a hydraulic roller cam, but your truck motor was only shifting at 5,500 RPM, you probably would be fine. But if you want to really rev the thing out, take advantage of the big cam like we had and make peak power out at the big end, you're definitely going to need more valve spring. Next thing is timing. As we showed, when we increased the timing from 35 degrees all the way up to 41 or 42 degrees of timing on the iron head, it definitely picked up power. And that's the way that we do it on the dyno. I'm not so concerned about the number as I am. If it makes more power when I add timing, I'll keep going until it stops making power. That tells me that's as much timing as that combination wants, and that's going to produce optimum power. Again, I don't care what that number is. The dyno tells me what it wants. And in this case, it wanted between 41 and 42 degrees on the iron rec port head. On the airflow research head, smaller chamber, aluminum, much better chamber design. It wanted less timing than the rec port head. Now let's talk about our cylinder head upgrade. The interesting thing is even though the rec port head ultimately flowed more air, not by a lot, but by a little bit, but because it did so at 700 valve lift and we didn't have a 700 lift camshaft in it, that camshaft couldn't take advantage of what that head had to offer. But even if we put a 700 lift cam in it so that we could get the big flow number from the rec port head, it still wouldn't make the same power that the airflow research head did. The reason for that, there are a number of reasons. One, slightly higher compression on the airflow research head, about seven tenths of a point. So like we talked about, 10 to 12 extra horsepower. But the real reason is airflow. If you look at the flow rates of the airflow research head, it flowed 30, 40, 50 CFM more than the rec board head did in the important lift ranges, in that important mid-lift range, the airflow research head, much better head. 
Also, if we look at the exhaust flow, 197 CFM versus 280 CFM, that's a dramatic difference in peak flow. And again, all the way through the range, the exhaust flow on the airflow research head, much better than the factory head. So what's our takeaway? You can do all of these things to any of your big bucks and obviously it will help run the right timing, have the right valve spring, and put on the right cylinder head. Remember, your holder, make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. I'll keep testing.